there's a couple of things. I just feel like a time like this, when the, when the family comes together, it's a time also to just be able to teach some of our family values, to teach some of the things that God is doing, uh, to hear God's word for Mavuno, but also to share some things that I think are helpful, that help us make sense of what God is doing. So this session, I think, is one of those where it's more of, it's, it's more of just understanding some things that maybe, if you're new to Mavuno, they may be difficult to understand. Even if you're old to Mavuno, by the way, they might make it, this, this particular thing that I'm going to teach might help you begin to understand some things you've seen and maybe not understood uh, as they've been happening. Thank you, Pastor James. So I want to talk a bit about discipleship conversations. Discipleship conversations. And you're going to understand why this is important as we go along. When you live in your house, you always need to understand that each house has different spaces for different reasons. Not every space in your family or in your house operates the same. There are certain things you do in certain spaces that you don't do in others. Am I talking to people who live in houses? There are certain things that rooms are used for that they're not used for, that, that, that only happen in those rooms. There are certain people who have only access to certain rooms. And that's, we, we want to talk, talk a bit about those spaces. So, hey, okay, these guys are already preaching. They can see, I can see they want me to talk quickly. They're in a hurry. So this is your house. Amen. <laughs> Master bedroom, come on. All right, this is your house. So your house has different spaces. And those spaces represent different audiences. For example, the porch, the outside of your front door, that's where you talk to strangers. If someone is a Boda guy, uh, a delivery guy, he's delivering a package to your house, do you invite him in, come and sit and have a cup of tea? Let's have a discussion. Even he would wonder, hey, this one is a cult. What are you doing inviting me in your house? I don't belong inside your house. I've just, just signed here and I'm gone. That's a place you talk to strangers, to people who are passing by, uh, not, to, not to people that you really know. And that's what a porch is for. Then when you have a visitor, if someone is coming to your house and they're a visitor, maybe you don't know them very well, maybe they're an honored person, maybe they're somebody you've met in church, you invite them home and you invite them to your living room, isn't it? They sit in the sitting room. That's where you host your visitors. Visitors are people who you want to honor. They're people that you want to have a conversation in, and you have them in your living room. The dining and the kitchen, if your house has that, I remember when my wife and I started, all these rooms were one room. <laughs> but you can have faith, and you say, there is a the kitchen, there. That place there is a the kitchen. <laughs> So the dining and the kitchen is where your guests come and your friends. When your visitor comes to the kitchen to bring dishes, he says, no, 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 sit, 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 sit. Visitors don't come to the kitchen. That's not for guests. Uh, that, that, that's not for visitors. That is now for people who are closer. They have come enough times. We have a relationship. I feel like, ah, when they come, ah, these ones can enter. These ones can come in. They can even help me with dishes. I don't, even wor I don't worry. They can come in and friends. And those ones we can even have as maybe even as I'm washing dishes, they come and stand with me as I'm washing dishes. Am I are you understanding? There's another level of access that they have that the visitor doesn't have. The visitor, you don't even want the visitor everywhere in your house. But the guest, the person who's your friend, that one now can come and even stand with you as you're washing dishes. In fact, you're like, ah, why are you sitting there? Come. Kuja tuonge. And you're washing your dishes, and they're watching you. The last room is the bedroom. Now, the bedroom is not for everybody. The bedroom, only some very special people come in. It might be your family member. It might be, if it's a friend, it's a very close friend. Um, I'm, you know, like, I'm just looking around this room. I know, you're, I know you're tight. How many members of your DG have been in your bedroom? Unless, unless you're like me when I started, when the whole house was the bedroom. But I'm not talking to those ones. I'm talking to the ones where it's a bit different. <laughs> you know, it's not a place that everybody comes to. It's a place where your children can go. You can send your child, go and get me this. Or they come and you're, you're doing something. Maybe you're parking and your child comes and sits and you can talk. It's a family space. 
And if it's a friend, I, it's not every friend. It's a very small circle of friends who will come into the bedroom. They have to be very close and very related. Now, I say that and it's obvious. But you know, it's interesting because this actually makes sense for us as a church in our discipleship conversations. If we can go to the next slide, you see something there about the kind of conversations. Okay, I, I'd forgotten there's that one. With strangers, you're polite and you're friendly. You don't get to... You don't hug the girl who has come, who has been sent to bring you mbogas from the market. Ah, it's good to see... He'll be like, hey, where, where? Who are you? <laughs> We're not that... We don't have that relationship, isn't it? It's polite, it's friendly. Hopefully it's friendly. You can even... Sometimes people are not friendly, but I think you should be friendly because they're, they're, they're still helping you in some way. When it comes to the person in the visitor, you're warm, you're welcoming, you're inclusive. That's a very important word, by the way, in the living room. What does inclusive mean? Inclusive means when people come, because we don't know them very well, there are some conversations we don't have. It's not that we are being bad, it's just that, you know, this, this is not their space, that's not what they came for. When we are being inclusive, it means, I don't know how many of you have had this conversation, I have it with my mom, because sometimes I'll take my friends from all over the country, in fact, even from other countries. And my mom will break out in fluent Kikuyu. And she's talking and I'm looking at her like, Mom, Pasis is from Uganda. In fact, I'm always very clear to say, this one is from Uganda. They speak English and Luganda. Even Kiswahili, they don't speak. <laughs> because I don't know why, I think when people are older, they feel nothing, eh? So she'll start giving me a, a story, and my friend is sitting there, and I'm thinking, this is not polite, mom. So sometimes I have to say, mom, uh, remember, Geneva is from Cumberland. If you can speak some cow, she'll feel very happy. You know, what am I doing? I'm being inclusive. Because what happens if you go to somebody's house and you sit, and then they have a whole conversation in Kikuyu? You feel, I did these people really want me here? Isn't it? Are they talking about me? Why are they not including me? and yet I am their visitor. So you have to be inclusive in that space. When you go to the dining and the kitchen, it becomes familiar. There are some things you can do that you couldn't do in the sitting room. There's ways that you can say, ah, it's Jackie, she's my friend. This one, even if we're talking, my mom is talking to me in Kikuyu, she will not take it personally. In fact, she knows, my mom even knows her, you know. This one, we can take a few, uh, we can do some things that are informal, Maybe still inclusive, we don't want to exclude the person, but we can make some assumptions. I can laugh with her and say, ah, you know my mom. And she'll just laugh back and say, yeah, I know your mom, you know. There's some things that we'll now include, but then there's also a place where you can also make some assumptions. When we go to the bedroom, there it's all assumptions. In the bedroom, if I'm talking to my children, I can talk to them in the mother tongue. I can say things I would never say anywhere else. Because these ones are people who should know. Tell anybody you should know. Yeah, by the time you're in the bedroom, you should know something. Yeah, you can't just be sitting on my bed and you, you don't know anything. You should be able to have a very deep conversation at that level. This is a place of challenge. This is a place where I'm asking, by the way, have you done the work I asked you to do? And the child is like, uh, mom, uh-uh, watch away, way. We can have a harder conversation because this one is not just anybody. Uh, and I can actually challenge and rebuke in that place. It's a place of inheritance. It's a place where we have deeper conversations. It's a place where we are able to have discipline and insider language. When I'm sitting with my parents and there's nobody else, we can have a conversation that no, they can start with assumptions. Because we've been together since 1970. <laughs> we don't have to start with, let me introduce myself, let me go through, which they can just jump into where we were yesterday without consulting. Because they make assumptions. And, and, and bedroom is a place where you can have difficult conversations and intimate conversations. Now let's move to the next slide and you'll see where I'm leading us in this direction, where I'm talking about this. Because in your church, in your discipleship group, there are also environments. When you're in a Mavuno church, there are also environments. The porch is your strangers. When you go somewhere to do your evangelism, you're in a children's home, You've decided to invite people to your DG to have a plot and have meat. You need, to be, you need to make sure you're polite. You need to make sure that you're not putting people off by being too, in, too click. Are you understanding? It's like you're talking about Mavuno things and it's like they're, they're wondering, what are they talking about? 
You're in your own space. At that point, you, even the guests will be like, hey, why did you invite us? So you have to be, when you're in an event, you have to be polite in a certain way. There are certain things we do in the gathering that we don't do at Fearless. Some of you have never come to Fearless. But Fearless is like a gathering, but we have many other churches here. So there are ways that we be... <laughs> Did you ever have ways that you behaved yourself when there were visitors? And your mom would just give her a look of... Wee, wee. And she doesn't even have to talk, she just looks. And you already know, hee, hee, hee. your hand was already on the next chapel. And then your mom looks from across the room. Woo. I'm so full. I don't even know why people are still eating. <laughs> I don't even like chapatis anyway. Just by a look. Because, because you understand at that point, this, this is not a place just for us to do anything we want. There are people around. And we have to be polite. When you come to the living room, then you have visitors. Visitors are people we have specially invited. They are now in our space. You see, when we were being polite, we were in their space. I've gone out to Great Wall. I'm sharing the gospel. I'm inviting people to come for a service. I'm out in a place where we've gone to do ministry in a school. I, there are ways that I behave because, hey, we're being polite here. When they come into our space, we can, we can do a few things, but we still have to be extremely warm and inclusive. There are certain things we don't do because we have guests. We want everyone to feel at home. So in your service, your service should not make somebody to feel like these people have insider language. These people are talking about things that are just flying over my head. These people, by the way, anybody who was around those days when Mavuno, the children's ministry had a different name. What was our, our original children's ministry name? Greenhouse. By the way, these original ones, they, these OGs, they still moon. They liked Greenhouse. You know why we changed it? It's because we realize when somebody comes from the outside and you say, oh, it's time for Greenhouse. They're thinking, are we planting crops? <laughs> Is it church planting time? What are they talking about? And then they even call Mavuno. What are these? These are harvest child. What are they doing? It sounds like a cult. What are these people doing? And so we say, no, 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 let's come up with a name that any stranger who walks into the door and sees the sign understands, Mavuno Kids. I can't tell you how many churches I go into where you look at the board outside and you have no clue. It's all gibberish. They've come up with very cool names, very cool names to them, but they mean nothing to somebody on the outside. And so we, we create language in church that includes. So whenever I'm leading... Um, I'll give you some examples. And by the way, if I, if I say something you do in your church, I'm not ngulikaying you. I'm not trying to embarrass you. It's just that you didn't know. But now you know. So if I'm praying in a Mavuno church, and it's a service that is a normal service, and I'm expecting there are people there who have just come in for the first time, I don't say, if you're filled with the blood, if you sense the anointing of the Lord is in the room, lift up your hands right now and just pray for yourself. What have you just said? That is, I know the words are English, but they, make, they mean nothing to a visitor. What does, what does washed with the blood mean? In fact, it sounds very gross. What have you slaughtered that we are supposed to be washing ourselves with? Is it, the, is it the people who are slaughtering before they came to church? What is going on? It doesn't make sense. Christians can use very Christian language, which can exclude their visitors. But remember, Mavuno... One of the things that God put us here is to reach the lost. We have the same calling as Jesus, to seek and save the lost. So in a church, whenever it's time for me to pray, even if it's a very deep spiritual moment, I will pray a pastoral prayer. I'll say, I sense there are people here who are hurting. There are people right now who maybe your marriage is not going well. Can you just lift up your hands right now? I want to pray for you. And I will pray for them. I will not assume they know how to pray for themselves. Because they didn't, in fact, they came to church because they don't know how to pray for themselves. So when you say pray for yourself, and then we just take some time, and we're all talking in tongues, and we're all walking around, and everybody's just in the Holy Spirit. The visitor is already feeling so creeped out. They are so spooked. They are thinking, where is the door? Have you ever noticed, by the way, visitors like standing at the back? They like sitting around there. So when things become too hot, <laughs> as you guys are in the Spirit, you look around, oh, do we have visitors? <laughs> All the visitors left, by the way. At that time after worship, when you guys were all speaking in tongues and walking around with your eyes closed, they all left. 
because they didn't understand what was happening. So I always tell my people, think, think about it this way. Imagine your good friend who's a Hindu invites you to his child's ceremony, and it's in the temple. And you've been inviting them to Mavuno, so they've been coming a few times. And so, they, so now you feel obliged. They've come six times. At least I have to go once. Because now I can't be inviting and then I don't get invited. So I'm like, let me go. And maybe you go with your girlfriend or if you're married, you go with your wife. And then when you come to the entrance, there's a big statue. And it's just looking at you. And then there's a priest who has, a guy who's dressed in some robes. And then he has something, he takes a red thing and he's putting dots on everybody in front of you. And you're getting closer. What are you feeling at that point? Your heart is beating like, oh God, oh God, what are they about to do? They put on you, shua. Then now you continue. As you, you reach a place where it, you remove shoes. You're like, huh? First of all, you hadn't even checked your socks. But you are, now everybody's removing. So you remove your shoes. Then you're moving along. And then you all of a sudden realize the women are going that way, the men are going this way. Now the only security you had has been taken away from you. The only person you could say, what are they doing? Now has gone to the other side of the room. And then you enter a place, there are no chairs, they're sitting on the floor. How are you feeling at this point, by the way? So you've never squatted even, you don't even know how to sit on the floor, so you sit. Then the, everybody starts chanting, Om Shanti, and they're doing something. By the way, what are you doing right now? How are you, how are you feeling right now? You're terrified. You're, even, even imagining gives you some palpitations, isn't it? You're already binding. You're like, God, whatever they're casting on me, I refuse it in Jesus' name. I don't know what these guys are doing. So, imagine now that visit of yours who's hearing washed in the blood. They've not been in church. Because we all, Christians always assume everybody has come to church. They've never been in a church. They don't understand what you're talking about. It's spooky to them. You need to always make sure your visitors are feeling at home. And you know what? We believe that Jesus loves people so much, he brings them as they are. Jesus was a friend of prostitutes and tax collectors. Why? Because he didn't judge them. He reached them on their terms. He had a language that they could understand. You know, it's interesting. I was telling my exec team, I had the privilege this week of leading a young man to Christ <coughs> who's not been to church since he was a kid. Has lived crazy, 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 crazy life. Crazy life. I mean, he, we had such a great conversation. I love this young guy. Um, he's, he's almost 30. We had such a great conversation. I talked to him about the gospel. I think for me, I never preach. I tell people the story of surrender. That's how, I, that's how I tell people. I just tell people, the king, there's a king. And I just explained the whole story that I was telling you earlier. And the guy told me, I've never had that. If they told me that in Sunday school, I'd have been going to church even till today. So I said, so I said, do you feel like this is something you'd want to do to surrender? And he said, I would. I said, do you want to go think about it or can I, can I pray for you? Can we pray right now? And he said, we can pray. So I said, so what I want you to do I'm going to pray for you because now you understand what the gospel is. It's surrender. I want you to pray for yourself, a prayer of surrender to Jesus. He said, I haven't prayed. I've never prayed. I said, don't worry. I'm modeling for you so that you can pray. It's a conversation. So I, I prayed, Jesus, thank you for your son. Thank you that he's coming to you. As he prays this prayer, give him even the, the, enable him to do it. So I tell him, it's your turn. So he said, oh God, hell. Like, that's how he talks, by the way. Then he said, oh, F. F is, uh, like, I've not been in front of you for a long time. <laughs> that prayer of surrender had, like, about five F words, huh? <laughs> like, that's how he talks. Like, he was so genuine. He was tearing. He was crying as he gave his life to Jesus. He wasn't being impolite. He doesn't even know that in front of pastors you don't curse. That's how far away from church he is. And so I, to I told him with trepidation. He asked me, so where do I go to church? So I tried to think, which Mavuno church won't spook him? <laughs> uh, 
washed by the blood. Because, I mean, the guy has not been to church for, for many, since he was a child. He hasn't been to church, literally. Because he went with his, ch- uh, with his mom to Sunday school. And this is it. He now has a wife. He has a child. And he's bringing them to Mavuno tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I just want you to know it could be your campus. <clears throat> yeah. So when you're asking people, pray for yourself, pray for yourself, oh, bro, bro, come on, Shambra. What are you saying? The guy is going, he's gone. Because it, what have you just done? You've kicked him out. You've told him we don't need you here. This is not a place for people like you. So we, we understand this is this, our service. Jesus says, come as you are. Come and see. Come and enjoy God. God is for everyone. And in our service, we want to have, we're going to have deep spiritual moments, but we're always going to translate them. By the way, even when I hear somebody, I love what Pastor Milton says. Whenever we're going to go into a time of anointing and prayer, and maybe the Holy Spirit is about to check in, and he's suspicious, God might do something spooky. He says, you might hear someone crying out just now. Don't worry about that. It's the Holy Spirit working. It's, what are you doing? You're explaining to that stranger because they're going to be spooked out. The first time I was in a place where people started being filled with the Spirit, I almost ran out. I didn't understand what was going on. So he's explaining that. So are you understanding what I'm talking about, a living room conversation? When you come to the dining room, your kitchen, your guests, your friends, that's when you have familiar, informal, inclusive, but with a lot of assumptions. And that's your worship night. That's your fearless summit. That's your network prayers. Now, there are some assumptions I make when we pray at 4.30. I make the assumption, you know what, this is a space for guests. It's a place where you've visited already and you've said, I like this family, I want to enter into their space. When you come as a guest into the space, we make some assumptions that you end up following along with. There are certain things that we do at the 4.30 prayers that are because of discipleship. And when we say, turn on your videos, what am I trying to teach you? I'm trying to teach you obedience. That's all I'm trying. And the reason I do it is God, God, God convicted me. And he said, you're a stubborn, hard-hearted person. And the people you lead are stubborn and hard-hearted. And he says, you do not follow instructions. By the way, me, I'm that guy. Instructions, I analyze why. Why am I being asked to do it? Why can't I do it the way I feel comfortable? And God had to deal with me and teach me to follow. Not because I wanted. I've told you this story before. My my bishop, his wife, uh, Pastor Bishop Oscar, his wife, Pastor B, confided with me one day. And she said, in the early days of Nairobi Chapel, when you're an intern, Pastor Oscar, we used to call him Pastor Oscar then. Pastor Oscar, his main prayer was, in fact, I would ask him, so what did Moraidi do today? After, by the way, when he comes home, he'd have so much issues. The wife would be like, was it Moraithi? He's like, that young man. That was me. So hard to lead. And I remember I was so broken when she told me that because I was a much older person then. I realized my pastor should have been fighting demons. Me, I've been a pastor. Now I'm a pastor of a church. I know those demons. He should have been paying attention. But what was he thinking about? His intern, Moraithi. The one who does not listen. The one who always has five ways of doing it. Why are we doing it this way? And by the way, I, I, I was very smart in school. I knew. See, I told you I was smart. So, I mean, the pastor would actually come and say, I think this is the way we should go. And I'd say, uh, may I? In the meeting, by the way. Then I'd say, that's a, that's a, good, that's a good idea. But as I've thought about it, as you are speaking, it becomes, and by the way, I would always, because he said we go this way, I'd have another idea. And he gets so frustrated. He's like, okay, fine. Do you want to, I mean, it's almost like he'd feel, he wouldn't say this because he was much older, but it's almost like I think he would think, so do you think you want to lead? Why don't you just follow what we're doing? Other people are following. Why can't you follow as well? And God convicted me about my hard heart. And so when you come to the 430 prayer, I want you to be convicted about your hard heart as well. At 4.30, whenever I come to your network prayers, I find those guys who, they'll turn on the light. No, they'll turn on their video because they know they'll be kicked out. But the light is off. (laughs) 
or it's facing the bulb. See, they want, see, they want, the, see, they want the video on, fine. The hard-heartedness. And you know what? It shows you how you respond to your father. That's exactly how you respond to God. Yeah, you can't follow. So, so this space, when our visitor walks in, they might get a bit confused and we try to explain. We try and say in Mavuno Church, you'll always hear your pastor saying, we always turn on our videos because it's not a vertical place, it's a horizontal place. Does your pastor say such things? And it's like they're trying to explain because if you, if you wandered in here by accident, just understand there's a reason we're here. This is a family space. It's not just anyone who's here. And if you're here now, you're one of those kids who came into a family meeting, and so you need to understand how our family operates. It's a discipleship space. So this is why it's important to understand the room we're in. Now, bedroom. Bedroom is where we have that very close... Aye, you have to, not everybody comes to bedroom. And you're in the family for you to be there. You're really part of the army. It's a place of challenge. It's a place of growth. It's a place where hard things can be said. It's a place of inheritance. It's a place of discipline and inside language. The gathering is a place of bedroom conversation. Today I've shared with you many things. I've told you I'm confused about your giving. <laughs> I would never say that by the way on a Sunday. Because those are not my people. These are visitors. But when you're here, this, man, you're an insider. This is your space. This is your house. And I have to be able to tell you as a dad, I'm shocked. I'm like, these are not the grades I was expecting. <laughs> Did you ever have that conversation with your parents? This, this, what is this? Like, what's happening? I don't understand. Explain to... Did your parents ever reach a place where they say, okay, you explain now? Because me, I don't know. I don't understand what's going on. You are number one. What is just going... What, what is this? What is this? What happened? You talk. No, no, no. Stop talking for him. Let him talk. <laughs> Who is it? Who are his friends? Have, who are, which friends are these you're working with who are cutting in on you? Which peer pressure is this? That's, that's a language of the family. That's the gathering. That's family night. Family night, we have family conversations. And I say, by the way, I'm, not, I'm aware there are people who are just on YouTube and they happen to be in the family. They happen to join the family. But I will still talk family language because I assume this is a family space. I've been amazed, by the way, to, to find out, my wife and I were being told about quite a few people who, in other countries, who discovered Family Night, and they decided they are Mavuno people. Like, I was shocked, because it's not, it's not targeted for visitors, but I know there's at least a couple of people who, even when they, a couple of them even came to Kenya and joined a Mavuno church, and they say, I learned about Mavuno from Family Night. I say, praise God, but that was not the intention of Family Night. <laughs> Family night is supposed to be a family conversation. When we share heart to heart with a family, when you have your discipleship leaders training with your, with your pastor, that's an inside conversation. When you have your associate training. And you know, it's interesting because when you understand this, then you begin to understand this is the conversation we're having right now. You don't take what we're doing in the gathering and take it into your services. Because you understand the services has people who are not within the family. Now, why is it so important to understand this? I think it's so important that we, we, we have this conversation. Why is this knowledge? How do you think this knowledge helps you? Maybe just talk to your neighbor for one second. How do you think this knowledge is important for you? Why do you think Pastor M would teach it to you? Why is this important? Why is it important that you understand this? Some of you serve in MYF. Some of you serve in different ministries, our youth ministry. Why is it important that you understand this? So let me share, even as you're sharing, let me share a couple of reasons 
why we must carry this knowledge. Right now, we are forming culture. And like I said, God is going to plant many churches through us. And very unexpected people here in this room are going to be planting churches. Very unexpected. The person sitting next to you is a serious church planter. They just don't know. They don't know it yet. They don't know it yet. So it's important that they understand some of these conversations. Huh? So let me say a couple of things. I'll just say six quick things why it's important for us to understand this. Number one, because you need to talk the, 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 the right language to the right people. That sounds very obvious, isn't it? If you talk the wrong language to the right people, they won't understand. I can't have a conversation that was supposed to be for my kids with my visitors. I'm, both of them are going to get confused. And yet we do that all the time in church. We do that all the time in church. Uh, I remember once I, go, I went to a concert and there was a big artist coming. Um, I think it was Donnie McClacken. And the team that was organizing, they really were excited about him coming. So they went to all the secular radio stations and announced that this guy was coming. Oh my gosh, Nairobi was buzzing. One of our cousins who had not gone to church for many years. In fact, that day when I saw his phone, I was like, hey, I'm not used to getting calls from this guy. And he calls and he says, you must have tickets. I'm like, what, do you, what tickets? He says, there's this Christian thing happening. Everyone is going, I can't miss. And I know you're a pastor. You must have tickets. <laughs> so that's the first time. I was like, oh, wow. I mean, like this guy is as secular as they get. And so I, I knew, I, I said, let me make a few calls. I called the church that was organizing. I was able to get, by the way, I became his hookup. He was like, I'm sure he had told his buddies, don't worry, I got you. I, got, I know a guy. <laughs> so I remember we went to the concert with my wife. It was packed. The place was packed. And this big artist comes on stage. But I think they forgot to tell him which conversation we were having. And so this guy starts, the music interlude is amazing, but he's the first guy I ever had, I mean, I had saying that day, if you're filled with the blood and washed with the blood, come on, stand up on your feet right now and begin to worship Jehovah. The Holy Spirit is coming across this room and let's just have a time of worship. The whole concert was a complete Christian jargon concert. Like no inclusion. It was completely for guys who are washed with the blood. At one point, I looked across the room and I saw my cousin, his girlfriend, a few other people standing up politely. And they left. I was cringing. I was cringing. They just didn't know who they were talking to. The importance of the right conversation. 1 Corinthians 9.22. To the weak I become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. Even if it's in your discipleship group, you need to understand which room are we in. Are we having a, a, a block party for our neighbors? Let's understand the language. What are we, who are we talking to? Number two, because we believe that people should come as they are. People should come as they are. I really believe this. Jesus doesn't ask you to change. He says, come as you are. God is powerful enough to change. You know, when that guy finished his prayer, I didn't tell him, that was a really good prayer of salvation. But... Those F-words, seriously, how do you expect to approach God like that? I didn't say that because I could see the sincerity of his heart. And I was like, the Holy Spirit himself will show him. He will learn. He's going to learn. He's, God is going to change him. When she walks into church with a miniskirt until here, you close your eyes. You know, because there are churches where they bring shukas and they put <laughs> on... They put on her. Basically, what have you told her? Never come back again. This is not a church for people like you. Yeah. By the way, there's a church that did that very famously in Nairobi. They had a signboard outside. It had no, quest it had no words. It just had miniskirt, long legs, X. Low top, X. What else? Tank top, X. Jeans tone, I mean, everything, you could just see like X, X, X. It's like they're showing you, if you're wearing any of these things, go home. I said, oh my God, what would Jesus say? The one who was surrounded by sinners. The one who you claim to represent. You need to speak the right language for the people. You know, the Pharisees, the Pharisees were horrified. I'm sure they were horrified when Jesus said to this tax collector, today salvation has come to this house. They're like, 
but this guy, he hasn't come to the temple. There are so many things he hasn't done yet. He has to do all these things. Ah, ah, ah. Salvation has come. Because he understood God will change him. Number three, because discipleship begins with a heart change and not a behavior change. This is very important for us to understand. If you focus on teaching your disciples what to do as opposed to how to be, you're going to create legalists. Who was, remember that series we were doing in April about legalism. You're going to create people who their Christianity is about what we don't do and what we do. Christians are people who don't wear torn jeans. Christians are people who don't curse. Christians are people who are, like you're, so, you're known for what you don't do as opposed to who you are. And there's a Christianity that's like that. By the way, it's a, it's a killing Christianity. It's about you judge people who are not like you because the behavior is what you're focusing on. Ah, Jesus is not about your behavior. He's about your heart. And when your heart changes, your behavior will change also. You know, my favorite service in Mavuno used to be the 12 o'clock when, when, when we were all one big church. I like the 12 o'clock because it was a hangover service. I liked it because people who would come in at 12, anyone who goes to church at 12 needs to sleep in the morning. And most of the time, the reason they need to sleep in the morning is because they had a headache. And most of the time, the reason they had a headache is not because of any other reason except they were out last night. And they're not in a Kesha, by the way. <laughs> so here's the thing. People would come into the 12 o'clock service. I loved it because that service, we wouldn't, it would be like, just come as you are. And worship would, would speak your language. What would happen is people would do mezizi, and a very crazy thing would happen. You just find after mezizi, the whole class starts coming to the nine o'clock service. Nobody told them. As God changed their hearts, people stopped clubbing. Then what do you do when you're not clubbing? You wake up early on Sunday, where are you going? Like their behavior would change as their hearts changed. Nobody told them. By the way, people wouldn't even tell them to stop wearing short skirts. You just see inches going down. As the Holy Spirit conviction is checking in. <laughs> Pastor Molly, your exhibit A. Abu, just stand up, they see how you dress, Pastor Molly. <laughs> what? I wish you knew Pastor Molly back in the day. <laughs> Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit himself. I don't need to change her until I dress like this. The Holy Spirit himself does it. Discipleship is about heart change. Your posture towards God. Number four, because Jesus loves us as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us that way. He loves us as we are, by the way. Jesus loves you just the way you are. But I always say, Jesus loves you too much to leave you that way. So the journey of discipleship means that as we need to be able to have another room to take you to. Now, when somebody tells Pastor Kilonzi, why are you making me turn on my video? I just came to pray. I'll say, Jesus loves you just as you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. That's your old ways. But slowly as you get to know God, you're changing. He wants you to become a disciple, not just a consumer. And so there has to be a journey, and that's why we have rooms, because we have, it's not that we're being fake, that we're talking one language here and another language. It's because we understand you have to grow. You can't be coming to Mavuno for 20 years and you're still sitting in that service. You've never come for prayer. You've never come for a gathering. There's a problem there. You're not growing. So we have to have the understanding that Jesus wants people to change. Number five, because armies are not trained using the language of civilians. Yeah. You don't train armies with the language. By the way, armies, they have their own language. Anybody here who's ever done military training or NYS or any of those? Yeah, there's a couple of you. By the way, by the time you're done with that training, you even have a different language. You speak different, you think different. Because they don't use the same um, language. When Major Boki was here last year, uh, was that last year? Yeah. It was this year. Oh my gosh, this year is, it feels like so long ago. And he talked to us about the army and the army way of life. You don't train like a civilian. You don't talk like a civilian. You don't think like a civilian. And you know what happens? As we go along this language, now the language I'm having with you is a very different language. By the way, when I preach, tomorrow I'll be on this same stage. And I'll be preaching from here. I'll be speaking very differently. Cindy or Geneva? Yeah, the people of Hill City will tell you, I've been preaching. And I'm talking very differently. I don't, I, I'm very, I'm a very nice guy on Sundays. Huh? <laughs> I'm very nice on Sundays. Because they're visitors. And I want them to draw close to God and be changed. 
but the language of the army changes. Yeah, here's where I say, we love you, but uh, if your video is not on, uh, you can pray in the waiting room. And Jesus is also there still. Yeah. And if you catch feelings, that's you. It shows your lack of discipleship. It's your hardened heart. Yeah, it's not me. It's you. Yeah. It's a different language. Because you're a disciple. You're not a person in the, 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 the sitting room. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 4 says, No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Number six, and the last point, is because Jesus had different conversations with the crowd than with the disciples. Jesus himself models this for us. The conversations he has with, his, with the crowd are very different. You notice his tone changes. He explains things a bit differently. He has a different way that he assumes on the disciples that he didn't assume on the people around him. And so when he's with the 12, he's able to have conversations. And in the, the scripture talks about the fact that when he was alone with the 12, they asked him about the parables and he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. By the way, whenever I talk to people who are new, who are non-believers, I don't explain the same way I explain when I'm explaining here. And the reason is because I know they're not ready. They don't even want to know, by the way. Uh, you, you, you have to know. By the way, I always tell my, I, teach, I, I was teaching my team this the other day. You need to understand the conversation you're having with people. When people tell you, how are you? Don't start with, you know, since Monday, when I woke up, this kapat, I don't know what has been happening here. And then, you know, my boss, they actually don't want to know. They're not asking because they're really interested. They're just asking and the correct answer is, fine. Yeah, that's all they want. So your stories, are, you're going to start seeing their eyes going like, have you ever seen guys, you're talking to someone who's already looking like, where is the nearest exit? Because I'm getting TMI, too much information. I didn't ask for this. So I told them, if you want to catch someone's attention when they ask you how you're doing, and you think, I need to tell them something about my life, but you've not yet gotten the permission, then you need to tell them something that will catch their attention. You need to say something like, oh my gosh, my life is incredible. The experience I've had this year, I've never had before. Like my life is so different now that the me now you're seeing is not who was here last year. It's amazing. How about you? How are you? <laughs> That's what I do, by the way. And they'll be like, me, I'm fine. Lakini, what are you saying? I'm like, oh my gosh. I mean, the things I'm discovering right now in my life, I wish someone told me when I was in my 20s. My life has been blown apart. It's crazy. I mean, if we, if we had time for coffee, I would tell you the story. The next thing, the guy is like, what are you doing Tuesday? Uh, how's your Tuesday? Where is Pastor Godwin? Pastor Godwin, did you have a conversation with me like that? Exactly like that two days ago. Yeah. Met a guy who asked me how I'm doing. He didn't want to know. So I told him exactly what I've told you. He's like... What are you doing Tuesday? By the way, he's somebody I really wanted to talk to, but I knew if I start giving him stories, he wouldn't give me the light of day. So I just told him, yeah. I told him exactly, and he's like, we need to sit down. I'm coming Tuesday, I'm coming with my notebook, I want to hear the story. I'm like, okay, see you Tuesday. Yeah. So I don't give more information to people who don't need it. That's why Jesus wouldn't teach them. He'd just tell them, there was a man who went and threw out seed. And, and, and some seed grew up and it was choked. And other seed was eaten. Ah, let him who has ears hear. By the way, he knew these guys are here for bread. They are wondering, when does the bread part come? <laughs> when is the chapels? When are these things being multiplied? I hear things are multiplied around here. I'm waiting for the time of impartation. They're not really interested. So he told them just what they needed. And then the disciples come afterwards and say, what did you mean about that? Come on, tell us more. And as they tarried, he says, the secrets of the kingdom are revealed to you, but not to them. So this is why it's important for us to understand. You don't tell people everything. There have to be new rooms. There have to be different spaces for the people who are interested as they get interested. So I taught you this today because I believe that God is going to give you leadership. And he's going to put you in spaces where you're leading in the kingdom. And he's going to have to, you're going to have to learn to understand the language. Who am I talking to right now? Am I talking to consumers? who are just here because of what they want. Am I talking to people who are ready to go deeper? How do I draw them deeper? And that's what these rooms begin to help us to do.
Now, I think I want to conclude and take a break because I want um, my MC to come and talk to us. But I want to say this as I do that. I really do believe that what, why God has blessed Mavuno over the years and why he'll continue to bless us is a heart that is open for lost people. As long as our campuses are open to reach people who don't like church, people who won't come to church, God will bless your campus. And he wants that. I mean, I love, um, when I, 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 I hope I don't embarrass her, but every time I've gone, when I've talked to Irene in Mavuno Diani, she's always thinking about her unsaved friends and how this church exists for them. And she's just thinking about how do I get them into church? Like we have to figure out how to get those guys into church. I believe God will bless that church because of that heart. And I think that's what's going to happen to all our churches as we begin to understand these are the rooms. This is what we do. Let them come in as they are. Let God change them where they are. Invite them a little deeper. And every space we're inviting you is a deeper space of discipleship. Come into prayer. That's a deeper space. Of, of course, when you come to prayer, you still have the motive of I'm here for a miracle. You're still a consumer in a bit, but at least you're praying now. You're not just saying I'm coming to church to be laid on hands. And then now you move a little farther, you're like, I want to come to a gathering and sit for a whole day. Oh my God, you're already thinking, I'm, I'm getting into the army. And by the time you're getting into that army, you're already leading. You're saying, I can aspire to lead. I want to be part of this army. I want to be inside this family. And at every stage, you're drawing people closer and closer to who God wants them to be. That's what we're about as a family. Amen. Amen.